uh, I was just looking up this morning the list of there's a list uh, put together for the previous year what were the leading banned books or challenged books because often this is going to be a school district that makes a decision or, or something like that and so the the leading uh, book there that's been banned or challenged over in previous years that the leading book is Captain Underpants how many of you have read Captain Underpants bunch right yeah okay well you you have read a banned book or challenged my own background I was trained in, in philosophy, but also in theology. One of my professors was R.A.F. McKenzie. He was in charge of the Pontifical Biblical School. So this is a, a, uh, a, an important school to study how to, well, how to study scripture in Rome. And he was in charge in the mid 60s. And there were many people that were not allowed to talk about the Bible. These would be Catholic priests, Jesuit professors, and they were silenced. They were not allowed to talk publicly. So he was responsible for getting those silences lifted. So, you know, so Captain Underpants, ways of reading the Bible. This session, we're holding this session because of the Stuart Rose book exhibit that opens next week. The, we have a major talk on the 29th, the evening of, and this is one of the most important, maybe it's the most important collection of general books in the world this year, maybe last year as well, because this is one of the world's most important, very top book collectors, and he has many of the classics. For most of us, we don't live so much in a book world anymore. Maybe you have textbooks and you know, you're forced to use them and then you will sell them uh, or something like that. But this collection of books, I mean, original Shakespeare, we're often talking first, usually first editions. The collection is incredible. We, uh, they're going to have uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, the original author's copy with the author's corrections where he wiped out characters and introduced other things. So there's a number of books in this collection that are just world, absolute world class. The first editions of the most important science books in the modern world. Einstein, Freud, I mean, it's just about, you name it, and it's there. Important writers, Wollstonecraft, the idea that women have rights, 18th century, there's books from the 1500s. Uh, so anyway, this is going to be an unbelievable collection, and what we're doing right now is to think about some of the banned books that are in that collection, and I'm going to talk for a minute about Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas for many. He, he, there are his... his, his uh, his, his face and shoulders and all that are sculpted on the Humanities Building. And there's also a quote from him. So he's very important in Catholic circles. And what we forget is that he was considered, that his works were considered extremely faulty uh, in his own day. And so for the first 50 years after his life, uh, well, beginning a few years after he died, 1277, his works were indirectly banned because certain sentences were condemned as being wrong. One of those sentences, I find this kind of interesting, is, and so kind of stretched for a second, that the first cause, the first cause is like that there's some source, there's some cause out of which everything came. He's, in talking about the first cause, he's actually building on Islamic thought because he has translations of the, um, you know, it's not just the Arabic numbers that we all use. I mean, go and try and do your calculations in Roman, Roman numerals. There's all sorts of ideas that come to us from Islam. And Thomas Aquinas was one of the early people to receive translations of the Islamic scientific works and to put them to use. Out of that, in studying Avicenna and others, Ibn Sine, one of the ideas he had was that there is a first cause, and we can know something about it. You know, God, for him. One of his conclusions, Thomas, from reading, uh, was that the first cause couldn't make possible worlds. Now, just, like, stretch around that for a second. 
is it, so Thomas was involved in this battle. Is it possible that there could be one cause of everything that exists? And start thinking about that. Is it possible that there are multiple worlds that exist right now? If you exist right now, you only exist in one of these worlds. Okay, so that's the battle. Thomas was judged as, uh, in terms of a comment on the idea that there's a form of humanity that we somehow share. And some of that's in relation to Jesus Christ. He got in trouble with, with archbishops of Canterbury, and they pretty much said that he was sliding into heresy. This is after he was dead. Now, he was canonized as a saint 49 years later in 1325, and then they had to take some of these condemnations away because, you know, should we, if, if this is a saint, then maybe we shouldn't say that he's also perhaps a heretic. So it's kind of interesting, you know, that the guy on the humanities building was maybe a heretic for many, mostly Franciscans. You know, this is like Steubenville in Ohio against UD. There's sometimes the other one is wrong. And that's what happened to him, but they lifted that when they decided to make him a saint. There's, uh, you know, Thomas Aquinas, a lot of his ideas then for Catholic universities, which was much of Europe, Jesuit education, th that was the currency of thought for a long time. And then we have individuals that start to see the world differently. Many of them are Catholic, many of them are not Catholic. One of the Catholics was named Descartes. How many of you have read or read about Descartes. Can you just, I just want to have some sense of Descartes, Cartesian thinking, I think therefore I am, any of that kind of stuff. It, you know, if you take a history course that focuses on the modern, even intros to history will treat that period and that name can come up in religious studies and in philosophy today. So then we, we, we ended up with, with certain ideas that Descartes, like focusing on the self and trying to, like, can you actually is there something about yourself that is totally and completely separate from the physical world? Is there a divide in you? Are you actually two totally and absolutely unconnected and different realities? Descartes kind of moves in that direction to some degree. I'd like to introduce in, in a moment now, um, I, I'm not sure what, um, Dr. Paul Mormon, but he, he was dean here of the College of Arts and Sciences for many years. He hired Professor Brecca, who spoke last. He hired myself. He hired different people, actually, in this room. And so he's been very foundational in terms of Marianist Hall being finished right. And many of the buildings, many of the programs, especially in the college, he's responsible for. Uh, he also was a student at UD. And so I've asked him to speak to us about banned books at UD. Maybe there are banned books at UD today. But he's going to talk to us about when he was a, a student here, and then later he was a dean. And so uh, I'd like to invite one of, a person like you, who was an undergraduate at UD, and that's uh, Dr. Paul Mormon. Dean Emeritus, I think is the way to say it. Please. Thank you, John. You get the title Dean Emeritus, that basically means that uh, you are a historical artifact. Uh, Dean Emeritus means that you are retired, uh, as I am, so they're bringing me back. Uh, interesting enough, I'm a historian by training. Uh, it's kind of ironic, being a historian by training, we spend a lot of time getting our students to consider primary sources and to evaluate the sources of everything. But I'm here today, interesting enough, as Dr. Inglis suggested, I'm actually the historical artifact. So ironically, I've actually become the object to be studied. 
And the reason why I say that is because what I want to do today is basically explain the world before the index of forbidden books was gone. The index of forbidden books, sometimes confused with banned books, it's a little more complicated than that. Actually, the index was eliminated, if I'm correct, Una, in 1966. Do I have that correct? Okay. I was a student at the University of Dayton before <clears throat> the index of banned books or the index was released. So I basically had my education at UD while the prohibition for certain books was still in effect. So what I'm going to try to do is give you some idea of what Catholic education was, not just at UD, but I'm going to go back, since I'm a historical artifact, I'm going to go back and talk a bit about my primary education, my secondary education, and my collegiate education, while the church operated not just under the index of banned books or the index of prohibited books, but there were some other ways the church controlled what you were to read, and I'll get into that a little bit later. By the time I graduated from UD in 1965, I went on to graduate study. And interesting enough, while I read no books on the index while at UD or throughout my education until I graduated, I spent most of my time in graduate school actually reading what had previously been banned books. And I spent a good deal of time studying the 17th century scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, which of course you cannot go into the study of the Enlightenment without reading a whole host of previously banned books that came under the index. Go down the list of key Enlightenment figures and you'll find in Voltaire, Diderot, I can go down the list of Elvisius, one after the other, we're all on the index at one point in time and another. <clears throat> I brought with me some other historical artifacts, a UD catalog in the early 1960s, outlining a course of work. I have here what was used in elementary school, the Baltimore Catechism, the prescribed work that all good Catholics were educated on in elementary school. I have here a textbook that was used for world history and American history in elementary school. Then we move on to UD. I have the text I used in moral theology. Okay. The text I used in metaphysics and the text I used in cosmology. Now, if you were a UD student with a major in history, as I was, or anybody who got a bachelor's degree in arts and sciences, had to not only fulfill the major requirements, but you had to take two minors. And one of those minors had to be philosophy. So you were required to take philosophy as a minor, which meant 18 hours of philosophy. In addition to that, you had to take 12 hours of theology. There weren't too many electives in those days. Most of it was required courses. So I want to give you a kind of historical sense of what Catholic education, because we kind of think of the index as way back there in the past. We talk about Galileo, maybe this guy Descartes. What does that have to do with us? Okay. Well, what I want to suggest to you that the index and the control of what you read and what you were exposed to went much deeper than that, and it was part of growing up Catholic when I was growing up Catholic, okay? So I want to put that in the context. So I grew up in Northwest Ohio. Actually, my great, great Grandfather came to the United States in the 1830s, founded a small community as part of the settlers in Northwest Ohio, actually a little town called Glandorf, or Glandorf, Ohio, which when I grew up was 100% Catholic. And if you grew up in the late 40s and early 50s, as I did, my grandfather eventually left Glandorf and went to a place called Columbus Grove, Ohio, where he bought a farm. Now, the interesting thing back in those days, you knew 
what areas were the Catholic areas and what areas were the Protestant areas. The Reformation was still being fought. Glandorf was 100% Catholic, and in fact their public school was run by nuns. And you would not know the difference between Glandorf High School and a Catholic school, although it was a public school. Columbus Grove, where I grew up, was initially a Protestant town. And when my grandfather moved there, there were perhaps a dozen Catholic families. When I came of age in the late 40s, early 50s, it was beginning to develop as a Catholic community. Now, the way you could tell that as the bus moved through the various country neighborhoods and picked up students, when it stopped at a Protestant household, you perhaps got one, maybe two students coming on board. You stopped at a Catholic household, it would not be unusual to have seven or eight young men and women coming on board. Do the math. A couple of generations, if you go to Columbus Grove today, it'll be a primarily Catholic community. Okay. Although the Reformation is no longer being fought out there. All right. Why do I tell you all this? Well, when you grew up and went to a Catholic school in Columbus Grove, Ohio, in the late 40s and early 50s, you would have been in a school that was run by four nuns. Eight grades, four nuns. There were about 20 students in each grade, and they ran the whole operation. The curriculum would have been built around the usual reading, writing, arithmetic, but also Baltimore Catechism, which you were taught. Okay. And so in that environment, what I want to understand, we ought to understand that while we see the index and we see prohibited books as something of the distant past, this was still very real. It was not just the index. There was another dimension to this. Okay, books were also reviewed and given what was called the nihil opstat or the imprimatur. Now, if you would look at my social studies textbook from the 1950s, you would find something we were taught to check for. The nihil opstat, the Latin meaning nothing stands in its way, meant that a Catholic censor had reviewed the book. And the imprimatur means that a religious clergyman had given his official stamp, and that term means let it be printed. And you were taught that if it came to anything controversial, you were to look to see whether the book had the nihil opstat and the imprimatur. And if it did, you could be assured there was nothing in there that was going to endanger your soul. All right? So that's something to look for. And if you'll check not only my grade school textbook, but my college textbooks, you will find it all has the proper imprimatur. The other thing we were taught was something called the Legion of Decency. Now, most of you, I see a few smiles over in that corner. Most of you are not familiar with the Legion of Decency, but as a Catholic student, you were taught that there were certain movies that you were not to see. And before you went to the movie house, you were carefully taught to look in a local Catholic paper to ensure that your movie you wanted to see was not on the prescribed list. Now, what got a movie on that list? Well, I can tell you this much. About 90% of what you see on cable TV starting at noon to the evening would be on that list. Close to 90%. There was such a thing called suggestive sequences would get you on the prohibited list. If you want to think of something that you may be familiar with, a movie such as Some Like It Hot, those of you who have seen that on reruns, with Marilyn Monroe. In fact, most of Marilyn Monroe's films would have been on that list. All right, so what I'm trying to suggest to you is that prior to the 1960s and the whole changes in the church, this notion of things being prescribed and carefully monitored was part and parcel of Catholic education. 
including education at the University of Dayton. Okay? So, what is the justification for all of this? You, of all, you go to a banned books display, most of us, and I suspect any of you listening to this presentation this morning, and most of you in the room would say, banning books is not a good idea, it's a thing of the past, we're beyond that, we should be able to read whatever we want to read. So what I want to do is put your head around the logic of why it made sense to put all these restrictions, and why it was so much a part and parcel of Catholic education when I was growing up. So it's very easy to understand the logic. Logic goes like this. There exists a body of religious truth that is accessible to all human beings and that it is necessary to adhere to that body of religious truth to achieve salvation. That's one. There is such a body of religious truth that humans have access to and you must believe this in order to achieve salvation. Two, that the Catholic Church is the divinely established institution, established by Jesus Christ, that under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that church is the custodian of that truth. Those of you who grew up in Catholic higher education would know that's generally known as the Bible and church tradition. Combined together is the body of that truth and those empowered as successors to St. Peter through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, body of that truth. And third, rebellion against the church is a rebellion therefore against the truth. And that to be outside of that church is to invite eternal damnation. So if you accept all of those statements, it follows that exposing people to something that is not the truth is putting their souls at jeopardy of eternal damnation. And what could be worse than that? And the analogy that would be used over and over again was used with me growing up. We have to be careful that we don't expose ourselves to ideas that are going to invite eternal damnation. And it is the job of the church to make sure we are not contaminated with these ideas. The analogy, again, would always be used with disease. If we think, we have talking about Ebola as a disease, we would fear that it comes to the United States. We have to stamp this out. So if disease is such that we have to, as responsible people, do what we can to contain it so that others aren't infected, what could be more serious than your eternal soul being infected with something that will lead to your eternal damnation? Once you've bought that logic, the thing follows. So I give you that logic so you can put it in the context. So how does this get played out? Well. One of the things you had to do is learn your Baltimore Catechism. Any of you familiar with this historical document know that it used a question and answer approach. We were taught, and then when the nuns wanted to test you, they'd ask you the question, and if you were smart, you had the answer. Okay? So on this question, why am I a Catholic? The question, how does our reason point out the truth of the Catholic religion? That's the question. Answer, our reason points out the truth of the Catholic religion by these principles. First, there is a God. Second, the soul of man is immortal. Third, all men are obliged to practice religion. Fourth, the religion God has revealed through Christ is worthy of belief. Fifth, Christ established a church which all are obliged to join. Sixth, the only true church of Christ is the Catholic Church. That's what you're taught. Then it goes on to ask the question, how can we prove that Christ established a church which all are obliged to join? And it similarly gives you the answers. How can we prove that the only true church of Christ is the Catholic church? Again, I could read you the answers that you were taught. Trust me. 
as a young man, I had most of this memorized at one time. Those of you who grew up at that time will know it starts with who made you? God made me. Made you. Why did God make you? And it goes on from there. Okay. Baltimore Catechism. There is a new edition of this out, is there not? This is the old one. Okay. It, of course, has the nihil opstat and the proper imprimatur there on the cover page. Inside the cover page. All right. How would this play out in social studies, which doesn't seem to be something that would normally come under the purview of church? But here's a textbook, the actual textbooks I used by a father furlong. Again, properly, Arthur Scanlon, the censor librarium, who is the official censor, has an STD, Doctorate in Sacred Theology, and the imprimatur comes from Patrick Cardinal Hayes. In the preface to the book, to give you the tone and the sense of this, the author has this to say, an outline of world's history suitable to the youthful mind is desirable even in the grammar grades of the elementary school. Such outlines have been formulated and many textbooks have been published to supply this admitted need in our schools. Now here's where you get to the interesting part. These textbooks, though in many ways excellence, do not give the correct Catholic viewpoint. The influence of the Catholic Church in all ages has been so single-handed, universal, and overwhelming that one would marvel at the audacity of textbook writers in ignoring and minimizing it, were it not mindful of the constant efforts of jealousy and prejudice to belittle the force of historical argument. It was the study of church history that drove the mighty Newman into the true fold. In issuing this volume, Father Furlong has completed an arduous task and performed a conspicuous service in the cause of education and truth. He has given us the general view of world's history from its very dawn and has awarded the Catholic Church its proper place in protecting and promoting civilization. What's the undertone? Regular historian textbooks don't give the Catholic viewpoint correctly. And this book's going to correct that. And of course, this is the book when you went through it, that not only I, but my brothers and sisters. There's Paul Mormon, James Mormon, Joan Mormon, and it goes on. All had exposure to this as their social studies text. Okay. All right. My point here is this censorship, this concern that you not be exposed to things that you weren't prepared to deal with for fear of jeopardizing your soul was an integral part of Catholic education. So don't think of the index and this whole thing as something that way back ancient history. Of course, you can see me as ancient history if you choose, okay? Now that brings us to the University of Dayton, which I attended in the early 1960s. This is the UD Bulletin. All right, so I majored in history, which meant I had to have a minor in philosophy as well as take 12 hours of theology. What were the courses? Logic, which by the way was the only textbook I used at UD that did not have the imprimatur and the nihil opstat on it. Logic apparently was not suspect to possible error. What were some of the other courses? Philosophical psychology. You might wonder what that was. Philosophical psychology. The description, the nature of life in general, and the essential difference between living and non-living beings, the plant soul and its powers, the brute animal soul and its powers, sensory and rational knowledge and appetite in man, the human intellect and will, intellectual and moral habits, the nature, origin, immortality of the human soul. That's the description of the course. If anybody familiar with basic fundamental medieval theology would have understood and see in here that what you have is the great chain of being. What was known as the great chain of being, that all life went from the lowest inert matter all the way up to perfection. And there are stages in between 
And what this course is basically doing is describing everything on that step forward. Okay, the other courses, epistemology, general metaphysics, and then what was called natural theology. These were courses that I took. Now, there were also courses required of non-Catholics if you happen to be a non-Catholic attending the University of Dayton and you majored in history, you still had to take philosophy, but there was a non-Catholic option which basically uh, did not present the material quite the same way as to reinforce Catholic doctrine. All right, so moral theology text. Some of you might want to read a moral theology text prior to uh, the mid-60s. If you followed everything in here, your life is pretty well, uh, well, what should I say? A lot of prescriptions. But as to the moral theological position when it comes to forbidden books, all right? There's a chapter in here called The Prohib Prohibition of Books. By the natural law, a person is forbidden to read any book that provides grave danger to his faith and morals. Hence, even if a person has received permission from the church to read a book forbidden by ecclesiastical law, he may not lawfully use this permission if the book is actually a grave danger to him. The ecclesiastical prohibition of books is twofold, general and particular. By the general law of the church, certain types of books are forbidden, even though they are not mentioned by name in the index. The general law is contained in Canon 1399. So what is making the distinction here is between books actually on the index and books that would not have the appropriate imprimatur. Now what? The Index of Forbidden Books contains a list of books that have been condemned by name. A penalty of excommunication, specially reserved by the Holy See, falls on those who publish or edit books by apostates, heretics, schismatics, which define apost apostasy, heresy, or schism, and also are those who knowingly read, defend, or retain such books or others forbidden by name through apostolic letters. So the prohibition is pretty severe. If you do not have proper, if you do not have proper authority or permission, you are not to read these books. So what in effect did this have if you were a student at the University of Dayton? The other day, anticipating this presentation, I went up into the library just to do a little bit of checking on Descartes, a little bit about him in a minute. And I found shelf after shelf of books on Descartes, his completed works, plus commentary, and so forth. Now, while the index was still in force, while I was a student at the University of Dayton, any book on the index was, that was in the library was put in a special area behind lock and key. There was a cage behind the main desk where these books were accumulated. No one could have access to those without special permission, which was extremely hard to get. And of course, being an undergraduate, I wasn't particularly eager to read Descartes or any of these books in any event. But nevertheless, that's where they would have been, okay? So the difference today is you can walk into the library over Resch Library and find many of the books that would have been on the index right on the open shelves. All right. So, that was what my education was like until I hit graduate school. When I hit graduate school, I got interested in studying not just Descartes, but Galileo, Copernicus, Voltaire, Diderot, the list goes on and on. I spent most of my time studying the development of religious toleration and where the idea came of liberty of conscience and the notion that one should have the right to determine to read what they wish 
and to make up their own mind, which is prevailing idea that permeates higher education today. Okay. So Descartes, I spent a lot of time with him. He was mentioned earlier. Those of you who are familiar with Descartes, it probably goes about as far as I think, therefore I am. But if you were a student at the University of Dayton, as I was, and you took cosmology, or you took metaphysics, and you open the sections on Descartes, this book, of course, has the imprimatur. I even have my name here, ninth month, 1964, is when I took this course. Also here, interesting, I found a pay stub from my summer job at Sylvania Electric Products in Ottawa, Ohio. I worked eight hours and got $15.04, which means I got paid about $1.80 an hour, which was the prevailing wage in a factory. Of course, the tuition at the University of Dayton, hold your breath, folks, is $21 a credit hour. That's the highest tuition bill I ever had here. Okay. Anyway, that's an aside. Now back to Descartes. So why was Descartes such a threat? His books were put on the index in 1663, interesting enough, about 300 years before the index was eliminated. Without getting into too much philosophy, there's basically three major reasons. First of all, the notion of methodical doubt and skepticism. If you read your Descartes, although he was a committed Catholic and very carefully avoid anything that suggests that he may have been an atheist, his vigorous skepticism and methodical doubt put everything in challenge. Although he put religion over here, it's very easy to see how that particular notion of methodical doubt and skepticism as a starting point and as it in fact did with the Cartesians as they gained influence in the late 17th century, beginning to challenge things that went beyond just science. So that's one thing. Second thing that Descartes did very aggressively is challenge scholasticism. The philosophy, particularly of Aristotle and Aquinas, and the whole scholastic philosophy of the Middle Ages, which was the adopted position of my teachers in philosophy that taught me at UD. So Descartes' ideas would have challenged their basic set of assumptions. Third reason, if you understand Descartes' dualism, he put the world into the what he called thinking matter, which is what our soul is, our mind is, and extended matter, which is the physical world, which he determined to be mechanical and operating according to mechanical laws. That rigid dualism suggested that everything in the physical world operated basically according to mathematical laws, and that's all the reality we could understand of the physical world. And in its own way, without getting into the theory of transubstantiation and the notion of the body and blood being changed, the bread and wine being changed into the body and blood of Christ, which kind of works well with Platonic thought, doesn't work too well with the mechanical ideas of Descartes. And finally, where he really goes after the scholastics is that Descartes' mechanical views gets rid of what the scholastics would call final causes. The powerful idea in Aquinas and the scholasticism is that you can understand physical phenomena based upon the purpose for which it exists, which is the cause or the teleological direction that something is moving towards. In other words, you explain an acorn has the potential to become an oak tree and seeking out that cause is an immediate cause of physical phenomena, but the whole world and all reality has a final cause, which fits in nice with Catholic theology that our final cause obviously is salvation. Descartes' mechanism in the new emerging science of the 17th century basically says we're not interested in final causes. All we want to do is explain how things work. Okay. So those are the reasons why he would be a challenge. And these textbooks basically that I had 
essentially sets you up, both cases, to say this is what Descartes taught, this is why Descartes is wrong, this is why the scholastics are right. So if you go through these textbooks and look at them, you'll find more often than not when they deal with Descartes, they're going to challenge the theory, challenge his view on final causes. And again, that's the kind of uh, philosophy that was taught here as a student. So, what I'm trying to suggest to you is that first, the index was still a reality when I was a student here in the early 60s. That in addition to the index, there were other provisions the church had to ensure that you were not exposed to anything that could endanger your soul. That was the prevailing idea. And that what basically shifted in a profound way happened at about the same time I moved from UD to graduate school. And the shift there is that you now go to a university such as UD today. What I went through, what I described here as a reality that I experienced was a reflection of that mindset. And what you will find as a reality today is the notion of liberty of conscience, exposure to ideas, and the autonomy of the human person making the decision. If you're a good Catholic under the guidance of the church, but nevertheless, you still assume responsibility for that, rather than the church's position and the educational system taking that responsibility on themselves and prohibited you from having exposure to those ideas. Hope that gives you some perspective. Thank you very much.